morning, everyone. All right, I hope you all enjoyed breakfast and had a good night's sleep last night. Uh, I'm Michael Baranowski. I'm the Student Association President for this year, and I would like to introduce you to our um, Leadership Symposium for Fall 2016. Um, I would also like to give a shout out to uh, CAS for providing the breakfast this morning. Uh, they did a wonderful job, and if anyone had any of those muffins, I absolutely loved them. Um, but uh, I would like to introduce President Battles here for us this evening, or this morning, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this morning, she'll uh, open us up with some nice kind words and kind of welcome everyone back to the school year. Uh, the Leadership Symposium uh, is put on by all the departments of uh, student and campus life, and it's the purpose of it is to bring students together with staff and welcome uh, students back to the school year. Um, so if you'd all have a warm welcome for President Battles, uh, she'll take over. Slight adjustments in order there. <laughs> well, welcome. My gosh, look at this room. This is exciting. We've been working and waiting for, for weeks and weeks until we get to this point of being able to launch the academic year. And I'll tell you, with your arrival, I can see that we're, we're, we've got it well in hand. This is just delightful to see you all here today. And I guess it falls to me to give you an official SUNY Geneseo welcome back. Uh, welcome back to campus to our 16-17 academic year and I especially want to say thank you all for returning early, cutting a little bit short, your summer break to join us here for this very important program. And I want to uh, thank, take this opportunity to thank our Leadership Symposium planning team for all of their good work in putting together this annual event. Maybe we can show them our appreciation. Well, I have looked at what you have in store for you, and I'm confident that you're going to find today to be very educational and informative and hopefully a wonderful opportunity to uh, make some reconnections and new connections among your, your fellow students and also the personnel of the college. I'm also delighted uh, that we have the benefit of our guest speaker, Josh Fagelson, here. And he is the founder and executive director of Ask Big Questions, an organization that works with colleges and universities to engage students in reflective conversations about purpose, identity, and responsibility. And those conversations build trust, strengthen community, and deepen understanding across lines of difference. And as a learning community, I'm sure you understand there has never been a more important time for us to be able to have those constructive conversations across lines of difference. We're living in a time when knowing how to engage in personal and civic conversations is absolutely critical. Learning to understand others helps us to learn about ourselves. Listening uh, and learning to engage constructively with people in our communities, learning to listen and talk face-to-face -face are all skills that can lead to very positive outcomes. And those and you in this room are all very key to those efforts. I know we have a broad range of student leaders. We have uh, sitting in the room everyone from the athletic team captains to resident hall leaders to student association leaders or a leader from one of our Greek or other organizations and clubs. You all play a critical role in ensuring that we here at Geneseo have a safe, dynamic, and inclusive community. You apply concepts of active leadership by setting examples for your fellow students. And trust me, they all do look to you as role models. You're here in this room because you're leaders. You're here because of your commitment. Your fellow students will look at you and they will learn from you. So as you go about your lives as Geneseo students, I encourage you to always have that in the back of your mind. I'm a role model, I'm a leader. Am I demonstrating the qualities that I'd like to affirm in my fellow students? Because they are watching and learning from you. You also continue to improve your skills through opportunities like the event we have today 
and also our exceptional and very unique Geneseo Opportunities for Leadership Development, our GOLD program. And we offer a variety of certificates so that you can gain new skills and competencies and, and appreciation uh, in a variety of fields that are relevant to your roles, not just here on campus, but really in society at large. You also step up and you work hard to achieve a goal or goals. And I certainly appreciate your efforts to do, to do so. We all depend on your talents. We depend on you to do the right thing and your devotion to both Geneseo and your fellow students. Now, I will tell you that one of the opportunities I have as Geneseo's president is that I have the great privilege and fortune to go out and meet a number of our alums. It's a very proud and committed group, by the way, and someday you'll be among them, right? and you'll be active and, and stalwart supporters of, of your alma mater. But I have the opportunity to go out and talk to these folks. And time and time again, what I learned from them is that while the particulars of their experiences may have differed, we have a, a community that is very engaged. And so I'll hear from these alums, well, I was very involved in this club. I was uh, deeply engaged in this service organization. I had a key role as a student leader in student association, whatever it might be. But the common thread there is that they come away from that saying, that experience really set me up for success in career, in life. And so please take full advantage of the privilege you have by serving in a position as a student leader and by taking full advantage of programs like this and those offered through the GOLD program to hone your skills and uh, engage your, your um, creativity and, and thought in expanding your horizons. So with that, I will turn it back over to uh, my, my colleague here. And I want to wish you all the very best for a successful fall and indeed a successful 2016-2017. So welcome back officially and have a great day. Thanks so much for all you do. All right. Thank you, President Battles, for those very kind words. Um, the theme for this leadership symposium, uh, if you guys haven't noticed the Constitution sitting on your table, has been kind of uh, about the political landscape of today. Um, it's the idea of learning to question what you hear, standing up for what is right, and most importantly, to facilitate conversations with people you might not agree with. Uh, President Battles also kind of noted our keynote speaker for this evening, Josh Fagelson. He is a rabbi, academic, father, husband, former orchestra coordinator, and social entrepreneur. In 2005, Josh founded Ask Big Questions with students at Northwestern University. And since 2011, he has led Ask Big Questions as a national organization dedicated to improving civil conversations across our divides, deepening civic engagement among young students, and empowering community change. Ask Big Questions mission is to engage young students in reflective community conversations, purpose, identity, and responsibility in order to build trust, strengthen community, and deepen understanding across lines of difference. Since 2011, Ask Big Questions has trained over 1,000 students, faculty, and staff on 110 different college campuses across North America, who in turn helped over 35,000 students engage in reflective community conversations. Josh is a leading writer and thinker about higher education and civic engagement. He holds a PhD from Northwestern in Religious Studies as well as a rabbinic ordination from YCT Rabbinical School and a BA from Yale University in Music. He lives in Sochi, Illinois with his wife Natalie Blitt and sons Yona, Micah, and Toby. I'd like to introduce Josh Fagelson, our keynote speaker for this morning. Right here. Oh, <laughs> Is the mic on? The lab mic? We're just, we're, there we go, this one. There we go. All right. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Michael. Thank you to President Battles. And um, it's great to be uh, here with all of you. Um, really excited to spend, the, to spend the morning with you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Tom Matthews, uh, the director of the GOLD program, 
uh, who Tom, Tom and I met um, at a conference earlier this summer on uh, civic leadership and democratic engagement. And, uh, and he was very gracious to come to a session that I did. And so he uh, then asked, he said, I'm looking for somebody who can come and help our students think about questions and conversations and civic life um, in the context of the election that we're going to be having this fall that all of us, I'm sure, are highly aware of. Uh, and so we thought this would be a great, a great way to spend um, the morning together. So thank you. Um, the schedule for, for what we're going to do is over the next hour, I'm going to, this can be highly interactive. It's not going to be me, me talking so much. It's going to be you doing a lot of talking and doing some work, getting to understand the power of what we call big questions. Um, then uh, we're going to, after about an hour, we're going to take a short break. You're going to um, have workshops that I think you know you're going to come back. There's going to be some refreshments. And then we'll um, close in this room with harvesting out some of the stuff that we've learned. Um, we'll, I will reveal what the things on the side of the room there mean, self, others, and questions. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll be on our way. So um, for the next hour, you got me. And um, I have you. And we've got each other. So that's where we're going we're gonna to get started. All right? Um, so behind me here, you can see a bunch of se several questions. And uh, these questions are probably different questions. They might be slightly unusual questions. Um, and these are some of what we call big questions. And we're going to explore this morning um, a little bit about what makes these questions what they are, why are they useful to you, um, how could you use these kinds of questions in your own leadership, uh, in your personal life, in your leadership on campus, in the organizations that you're involved with, as citizens of this democracy, of uh, Geneseo, or of the state of New York, or of the United States. Um, so to do that, I want to actually get us started with a slightly different task. Uh, and it's not that one. It's this one. There we go. Um, I want you to think for a second about a recent conversation that you've had. Let's say it's in the last couple of months. And it was a particularly good conversation, one-on-one -on -one conversation that you've had um, with somebody. Try to bring that conversation to mind. It doesn't have to be the last couple of months, actually. It could just be a memorable one-on-one -on -one conversation that you've had that's been particularly meaningful. Think of that for a second. Everybody got one? So when you think about that, what are some words that come to mind to describe that conversation? What's a word? Thought provoking. Great. What else? You can just shout it out. Insightful. Empowering. Honest, calm, unafraid. Now we're going to start adding a few more words. What else? Intriguing, intense, authentic. Great. All right. We're going to stop there. That's great. So that's a good private conversation. OK? So now, let's flip over to this side here, a bad private conversation that you remember, a one-on-one. -on -one. Condescending, controversial, judgmental, frustrating, uncomfortable. What was that? Emotional? Ignorant, biased, okay, dissonance. Everyone knows what that word means. It, it, it was probably a typo. It was orchestra conductor, not coordinator. Dis, dissonance is a good musical term, uh, right? This is something that's not in harmony, right? It's, uh, it's dissonant. Okay, great list. Let's go up one. So now think of public conversations you've been part of. And you can sort of categorize that. You, you can define that for yourself. Um, but I'm going to define that minimally as a conversation that involves more than three people, three or more people. But that could be a conversation maybe that was a very public conversation like in this room. So it's not a one-on-one -on -one conversation that happens to happen in public. It's a conversation among the public. Okay? So 
a bad public conversation. This should not be hard to think of. Um, <laughs> what would you say? What are some words? Six. Discordance. Good word. What was another one? Interrupting. That was kind of funny. Yeah. Disorganized. Derailed. Boring. Good one. Narrow minded. Uninformed. Angry. Any more? Mob mentality. <laughs> All right, now, if we move over to good public conversations good public conversations that you've been part of. What do you got? Hmm? Inclusive. Motivating. Open-minded. Respectful. Empathetic. Accepting. Beautiful words. What? Inspiring. Any more? Challenging. Challenging. Funny that that was the very first one we had. Yep. Fulfilling. Okay. Progressive? In what sense? Can you just say a little bit more? Can you, say, can you just define that a little bit more? Can you just raise your hand so I can see you? There you go. Progressive. Yeah. Okay. So not progressive in the political sense. Progressive in like we're making some progress here. Okay, great. Informative. Okay, great. This is a great list. I feel like a weatherman. Because, um, oh, I didn't, I misspelled disrespectful. Okay, anyway, um, so we have a lot of conversations like this, right, on this side. And Ask Big Questions is really about how can we make these conversations into these conversations. And primarily, I would say we're really focused on the public level, right? That's what really matters the most to us. But I would also say that the public level and the private level are totally interwoven. If we're not doing this well in our private lives, we're not going to do it well in our public lives. And so it's some, a lot of the same skills that we're going to need for having better public conversations are ones we're going to need to have better private conversations as well. So what we're going to do um, in the next 45 minutes is um, we're going to actually have a little conversation. Um, at your tables, among, among yourselves. Um, and we're going to learn a little bit from that. We're going to talk about what makes um, big questions different than what we call hard questions and how to use that skill. And then you're going to have a chance to play with that skill um, for, for a few minutes, OK? So um, what I would like to ask you to do is on your table, you have um, a little booklet. You have two little booklets. You have one that has the US Constitution. Don't look at that one right now. <laughs> Look at the other one that says, ask big questions in the front. And yes, they are different colors. And yes, there are different questions in each color. What I'd, like to a what I'd like you to do is to look through and find one question that speaks to you, grabs you for whatever reason. And you'll note that there's, there, there's a front side to the card and a back side to the card. Right? The front side is full color, and the back side is white. Um, and so you'll see that there's a big question in the front, and there's some sort of smaller questions in the back. So if you find a question that speaks to you, and then turn to your neighbor. There should be eight people at each table, roughly. Um, and so try to find a partner. And um, talk about the question, answer the questions that are on the card. Okay, share, that, share, those, share those questions with each other and why they spoke to you. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do this. Okay, so each of you should have, you'll have five minutes with your card and five minutes with your, with your neighbor's card. Okay, um, and then we're going to check in in about 10 minutes and see um, how things are going. All right? Everybody understand the assignment? All right. You're off and running. Great. It's more elegant than shushing. And if you, uh, 
if you're ever a facilitator, I encourage you to have some, to ask someone to buy you this as a present, which is what happened. Actually, I didn't ask; they just bought it for me. But it's by far the most valuable thing. So, uh, great. I'd love to check in. How are you? How do you feel? Uh, say, say, say a little more than good. Overwhelmed. Can you say a little bit more about overwhelmed? Just speak up so we can all hear you. Ah, did you try the back in the back side? Yeah. Even on the back side, it was hard to get interesting. Okay, so they were for you. They were a little too big. Who else? Who wants to chime in? How do you feel? Inspired. Inspired. Can you say a little bit more about that? And stand, stand up and say your name and share that with us a little bit. I'm putting you on the spot. Here you go. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> See, that's great. And those booklets are cheaper than a cup of coffee. All right. Uh, <laughs> Go back there. No, yeah, table 33. Just, just tell us your name and liberating. That's awesome. Thank you. You made my day. Uh, one more. Who, who, anything, anything else in terms of how you're feeling or, yeah, how do you feel? One more. Yeah. Go ahead. Stand up. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So we feel connected, energized. It uh, sounded like, I, to summarize, like seen or, or what well, you said, liberated, and seen and heard in a different way. Um, some, in some cases, they were almost they were too big, right, uh, it, to, to, to get around. So let me ask you a next question. What do you notice about these questions? Is there anything you notice about the questions, about the, about the cards or about the questions? What do you notice? Okay. They focus on relationships. They, they seem to, a lot of them seem to focus on relationships. Okay, that's interesting. What else? Yeah, they, they're, they're sort of different dimensions of a similar, you know, similar set of questions. Yep. Uh, what else did you notice? There's not, there's not a simple answer. You have to describe what's going on, um, especially on the back side. They probably lead to stories because those questions ask for stories typically, right? Um, what else did you notice? So okay, so they, they seem simple. They're deceptive, right? They, they they look oh, it's so simple, and then no, they're actually not. When you start peeling back layers, what about just mechanically? Is there anything that you notice about these questions? Just in terms of the mechanics, the linguistics, the linguistics of these questions. Uh, one of your one of your professors and I were talking about this before. Uh, yeah, the first word of it, the who, what, when, where, and why, are the abbreviation that we associate with them. So like, when do these questions get put into? Uh huh. So in some cases, they, they deviate, right? Also, just note, what words do they start with, typically? What word, what word is notably absent, actually? Why, why right? There, there's no, there's no, none of these questions start with why. Um, and, we can, and we can reflect on that for a second. They're also, every one of them is directed at someone. They're directed at you or at us, right, at we. Um, there's no, like, what's the meaning of, right? So. So let me tell you a little bit about, about, about these questions and sort of how they got started, okay? And this is sort of the, the theory of, of big questions. So, um, and, and I'll, I have to do it by way of a story. Uh, so um, about this time, 11 years ago or so, I had just arrived at Northwestern University. Um, I came there to work at the campus Hillel uh, to be the rabbi there. And um, if any of you in the room are Jewish, um, you might be thinking right now about 
it's turning into the fall, and the fall is generally is, is always the season of the Jewish high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And those holidays are like our, our big events, big, big main events, when everybody comes to synagogue and you know, big services. And, so, and it always coincides with the beginning of school. Uh, and so any rabbi, especially any rabbi in campus, is going to be thinking about what do we do for the high holidays this year? And at Northwestern's, on Northwestern's campus, how many of you have been to, visited Northwestern or Evanston? Any of you ever seen it? A few hands? OK. So Northwestern um, has a spot. And I imagine you have a spot here too, where like all of the student groups hang these like painted sheets to announce their upcoming events, right? And so you've got um, you know Thursday night, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream by the theater group, and Friday night, big party at Sigma Chi, and then we're going to put up Yom Kippur Saturday, repent. <laughs> and and then a funny thing happened on the way to Yom Kippur. Uh, I you know we realized two things. Number one. Um, we could actually afford to go to Kinko's and get a nice formatted banner and not just make a painted sheet. Um, so that was good. Started a very long and lucrative relationship with Kinko's. For Kinko's, I should say, not lucrative for us. Um, and, but more importantly, number two, rather than just making an announcement right, that Yom Kippur is coming up, sort of intuitively, I thought, well, we should put a question on that banner just to sort of extend the educational environment. Right? It would be more engaging if we asked the question. And intuitively, again, just, I had a hunch. The right question to put on that banner was the theme of the high holidays, which was, what will you do better this year? And so we put that question, what will you do better this year, on this banner. And then we had little examples of things you could do better. Drink fair trade coffee, donate blood, call your parents, vote, right? And, uh, and people came up to me afterwards, and they, they said, you know, um, that banner that you guys made, that was really great. Um, my friend and I, we were walking along. We wound up in a great conversation about what we were going to do better this year. You should make more banners. So we started making more banners. So at, th at Thanksgiving, we had what are you thankful for? And during fraternity and sorority rush, we had who's in your community, right? And one thing led to another. Um, we made more of these banners. Students started getting excited about these questions. We made little card booklets like uh, the ones you have here. Um, we started to have the rock star professors do a salon in the campus Starbucks about these kinds of uh, these questions. And, um, and then you know, a wonderful thing happened. Uh, you know, a few years later, uh, this, was going, this was humming along. And I was at a conference. And you should all be so fortunate in your life to have this moment happen to you where somebody with a lot of money walks up to you and says, I have a lot of money, and I'd like to invest in your idea. Um, <laughs> so it's entirely uh, good fortune and grace that that, 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 that happened. Um, and so we were, we, uh, ph philanthropy would, you know, expressed interest in helping us scale this, and so we became a national organization, um, asked big questions. And so we've been running now for the last, it's our fifth year, or sixth year, we've been running for the last five years. Um, and when we did that, when we became a national organization, we started teaching students to be facilitators of community conversations. We're not teaching you today to be facilitators. We're not teaching you facilitation skills. We're really just giving you this, this core skill about big questions and hard questions, which I'll define in a second. Um, but we started actually teaching students, and, we, and this is really our, our bread and butter work, is teaching students to be facilitators of community conversations using these kinds of questions and getting in groups of eight or 10 or 14 students together to have conversations about for whom are we responsible and where do we feel at home and those kinds of questions. When we started to do that, we had to figure out, well, what exactly are we teaching? Right? Intuitively, I knew there were certain questions that worked better than others. But we didn't have any criteria for why. And so we sat, and we thought, and we played around. And we realized, we came to realize that there's a couple of key criteria, the fundamental criteria. And these you have, by the way, on your own sheet. You can follow along. You can play at home um, right here. But you can also look up on the, on the weather map. Um, so we realized that the key to big questions, the key of all of these questions that are in this booklet, is that they satisfy two fundamental criteria. Number one, they matter to everyone. They matter to all human beings. And number two, everyone, all human beings, at least the ones who have language ability and some experience, can answer them. OK? So um, and it's important to sort of walk through this for a second so you understand it. Um, we have questions in our lives that everyone can answer. This, by the way, is a counterintuitive thing. The, the x-axis goes right to left, right? So in case you're struggling with that. Um, but we have questions that everyone can answer, 
uh, but that fundamentally don't matter. My guess is you have experienced some of these questions recently. They're generally known as icebreaker questions. And they're questions like, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Right? We ask those questions because everyone can answer them, and they're totally low stakes. It doesn't really matter, unless you are Ben or Jerry. Right? The answer to that question is not really going to matter. Right? Um, so those are, that, that's sort of your small question, your icebreaker question. Let's go over here to the opposite corner, and you've got a question that um, matters to everyone, but nobody can answer. Like an unanswer we call that an unanswerable question. So in my business, um, I would say uh, that, you know, do you believe, does God exist? Does God exist? Do you believe in God? You can answer. Does God exist? That, I would say, probably matters to everybody. Everybody sort of encounters that question at some point in their life, but you can't fundamentally answer that, you know, objectively. Um, that's going to be ultimately a personal one. So where things get really interesting, realizing I should have a laser pointer, but I'm going to use this little hand. Where, where things get really interesting is right here. And if you learn nothing else today, this is the part you want to pay attention to, okay? So the difference that we, between what we call hard questions and big questions. Hard questions are a lot like big questions. They matter to everybody, right? They're, they're, they're high stakes, but only some people can answer them. Specifically, people who think they have enough expertise to answer that question. And I emphasize think they have enough expertise. They may or may not, but you know, fake it till you make it. So um, a good example would be, let's say you are at a, you're at dinner with 10 people. This may or may not have happened to you in the recent couple of months. You're at dinner with 10 people, and the conversation turns to who should you vote for or who's going to win the election, even better. Who's going to win the election? Right? Now tell me, just tell me if this maybe resonates with your experience. My guess that is that within about 10 minutes, or even 5 minutes, there are 10 people at dinner, things seems, seems going to look like this. Three people are off in the living room watching the game. Three people have made it to the kitchen to go get dessert ready. Two people are still sitting at the table but are like, you know, doing that. And the two people who think they really know something about American politics, regardless of whether they actually know anything, are like duking it out, right? It might have been about, you know, Bernie and Hillary, or now it might be about you know, Trump and Hillary. Um, but whatever it was, they're duking it out. And there goes, your, there goes your dinner. And the setup to that question was a hard question. Who's going to win? That question matters to everyone. But not everybody can answer that question. You have to think that you have enough expertise. Chances are, by the way, the two people who think they have enough expertise don't actually have any expertise in that, um, in that conversation. But uh, in, in, any, in any case, what happens to that dinner is that it becomes fragmented. And those people become engaged in jockeying for power and to prove themselves, right? to prove how smart they are and to prove um, that they know and they're, and they're the expert. Now, what if you change that question to how do we decide who to vote for? How do we decide who to vote for? That's a different question. That's not asking who's going to win. That's not asking me, you know, use your best predictive ability, give me all the information that you have. That's actually talking about, well, what are my values, right? What's important to me? How do I go about deciding whether I'm going to vote and who I'm going to vote for? That's, I'm, not tr I'm not trying to convince anybody at that point. I'm just sort of reflecting. When we go back to the questions that we saw up here, or you see the, booklet, the questions in your booklet, those are, the, these, these are those kind of questions, right? They're questions that matter to everyone that everyone can answer. They don't require any particular expertise. They require some experience. They require some life experience. But my general rule of thumb for a big question is, if, if you have a body and you've been on the planet for more than about 10 minutes, right, you should be able to have a meaningful reflection on where do you feel at home, or for whom are we responsible, or what do we choose to ignore, who represents you, when do we trust, and the, and the other questions that are in your booklets. Um, and the difference that, that those questions can make right, is enormous. If you have your dinner where that's the question, people are not going to be splintering off to the living room or the kitchen or you know, onto their device. Um, it's a very different kind of question. And as leaders, we'll talk about this more after, um, after uh, your sessions, but especially in your work as leaders on this campus and leaders in a community and leaders in, um, in society, uh, I think more and more we need leaders who understand the role that these questions can play and why they are so important, they're actually much harder than hard questions to answer. 
um, because they don't have a clear answer. They're not about proving how much we know or how much power we have. Um, they're not about jockeying for position. They're actually about creating the space for people to be able to reflect together and to be able to share a question. My rule of thumb for these kinds of questions, second rule of thumb, right thumb, left thumb, I guess. Um, my second rule of thumb is that, you know, can I, can I imagine that my 11-year-old middle child and my 80-year-old father right, could both have a meaningful conversation about these kinds of questions? So really, it's anyone um, without any particular expertise. We could ask anyone in town, where do you feel at home? Um, and we could get a meaningful answer to that because you're human and you've had some experience and that's an inescapable sort of framework for us, okay? So, does everybody get that, uh, about that distinction between big questions and hard questions? I, as I said, that's like the most important thing that, you, that I'm gonna teach you today. And um, I'll just also say that I think that our politics, I think our campuses, um, I think our education system is really suffused with hard questions. You know, I did a PhD program and PhD programs at the end of the day are about proving that you know as much as the person who gave you your PhD and so now you can be the expert and stand behind the lectern um, and wear the jacket. And, uh, and that's really important. Expertise is very important and science is really important and having facts is really important. And without that being paired with a framework of big questions and a reflective environment where we're able to share questions and stories and not just information, um, we're not gonna survive. We have massive challenges ahead of us right now and we need a society where we're having these kinds of conversations and we can build um, trust and understanding. So that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more after, after the break. But what I wanna do right now is actually give you a chance to play with this a little bit. On the, on the back of, so there's, there's a couple of sheets that you have here. So this is, this is the typology thing. Um, on the back of that, you see a few more dimensions of big questions. Uh, you can see how we distinguish between the two. Importantly, as I mentioned before, a big question is always focused on a subject, not an object. So it's directed at you or at us, right? Um, it uses plain language. We don't use technical language, right? We really try to keep these you know, to minimal syllables. Um, it, generally, there's seven words or fewer, right? It's another thing to, it's an, it's another thing to note. And the thing, one of the things that's not on here is they also work in tandem with the back of the card questions, right? So you saw that there are, there are back of the card questions. Those, the front of the card are too big. You're not gonna sit down with somebody, and what's your name? Ashley. 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 So I'm not gonna sit down with Ashley and say, Ashley, so nice to meet you. Who are you responsible for, right? Too big, we're, we're, not, we're not gonna have that conversation. Um, but I might sit down with Ashley and after we've you know, gotten a little you know, to know each other, we might ask one of the back of the card questions, right? Um, tell me about a time that like, you, know, you feel like you really took responsibility for something. Because um, that actually asks for a story. That's not asking an existential question. That's not asking for who are you responsible for. That's asking, tell me a story about a time. Um, any of you who have ever done HR interviewed for anything, you might have encountered what's called behavioral interviewing. Behavioral interviewing is asking those kind of questions. Tell me about a time that you did X, Y, or Z. So it's using that same technique, but it's framed by a larger human question, a, a question that we share. So that's the difference. The, the difference between big questions and hard questions is important to look at because so many of us are so schooled in hard questions. There's a lot that we have to sort of unwind a little bit if we're gonna be able to access big questions. But what I want you to give you some time to do is actually play with this a bit. Um, and there's a, so there's a, a worksheet here that says from issues to questions. You see that? Print it out funny. Okay. So there's a chart here. And what I want to give you, you know, about 10, 15 minutes to do is to actually work together, um, maybe in, in groups of three, I mean there's eight of you at a table, so it might be a group of, if there's seven or eight, you'll figure it out. If you can do it in groups of three, two or three, um, is to, uh, to move from, what we, to do what we call moving from issues to questions. None of us really thinks, including me, thinks in terms of big questions. I don't walk around through the world thinking about for whom we're responsible, right? I, I, I think about um, specific people I'm responsible for. Today's my kid's first day of school. Right? Or, uh, and so are they getting there and are they getting back 
you know, or how are my parents doing, or I'm responsible to you all right now, and are we on time? I'm thinking about specific tasks, but I'm not reflecting. I'm, I'm not, you know, it's not in the foreground of my mind to like be um, swimming in the question for whom are we responsible. But so most of us confront the confront the world through issues or events, and so if we were to take the issue of, for instance. Um, well, if you were to name, what do you think is, a, is an important issue on this campus right now? Just shout it out. Men mental health. Mental health. Let's do that. Okay? Mental health. So if, if we entered, if we put mental health in here as the, uh, as the issue, right? And then we were to think about what are some of the hard questions around mental health on campus? Like we might think about, how can we ensure that every student has access to mental health services? How, can, how do we um, lower the incidence of, uh, of hospitalization for mental health um, uh, situations? Um, what are some other ones? Sort of the, the hard questions, the questions that you know, we really want to solve. They're usually the policy questions. How can we change the stigma associated with um, mental health, with mental illness and mental health issues? Great. So usually those are a lot of how can we or what should we do about kinds of questions, right? Um, so now if we go one level further, those, aren't, those are hard questions. Those aren't big questions, right? Because to answer those questions, you really have to have some expertise. You have to study the issue. You might want to read up on... Uh, what are other campuses doing? What are national trends? What are best practices? What do we know about different forms of mental illness and the different mental health issues that students might encounter? There's all sorts of information we would need. That's really important. If we were to get to the big questions that are under, a big question that's underlying that, look at the list up above the chart. You see there's three columns, and those are all examples of big questions. You could look at the ones that are in your booklet. What's one that sort of comes to mind as being related then to the issue of mental health? How do you recharge? Okay, that's one. What's another one? What do we assume? When do you feel secure? Maybe what do we choose to ignore, right? Um, th for whom are we responsible? I'll give you a hint. All roads lead to for whom are we responsible, at least in my book. <laughs> uh, because as, as, we, as we pointed out before, there's a lot of overlap, right? A lot of these questions, given their nature, they, they're different dimensions on, on, on a similar question. Um, but all of those are ways that we might get at the question of mental health. But now we're not getting at, we're, we're not opening up, let's imagine that we were having a conversation in the Starbucks here about what should we do about mental health issues on campus. Only the people who feel like they know something or are particularly motivated would probably show up to that, right? But if you were to have a conversation among your student group about what do we choose to ignore, and all of us ignore things in our own lives all the time. If we didn't, we wouldn't make it, right? We, we, we pay attention to the things we pay attention to, and we say, I'm going to shelve that for right now. Um, but you might be able to re lead a reflective conversation, getting people to share their stories about um, what do we choose to ignore. And you could then steer that towards, when you think about mental health issues on campus, how does, that, how does this question bear on that? And people might come up with things like, you know, I really, we really, I need to not ignore the stuff that's in my own life, or I need to take some more responsibility for my roommate, or you know, we we shouldn't ignore. We need to make a more inclusive community where people don't feel ignored; they feel embraced. Do you see how that works? So if if we if we start with a big question, you change the frame of reference of the conversation, and it allows us to have a different kind of conversation and get back to get to the hard questions, but with a very different sort of dimension on it. Okay. So what I'd like to give you, to, to ask you to do is um, for the next few minutes. Um, see if you can do like three lines of this together, okay? And so choose, find an event or an issue. Could be something like mental health. It could be something like um, if you have homecoming here or whatever, you know, whatever event is coming up. Um, think about what's an issue or event. What's a couple of hard questions that are associated with that? How should we, what should we do about? And then what's a big question from the list that you might see as related to that, okay? So I'll give you about 10 minutes for that, and then we'll, we'll check back in. Go ahead. OK. I'm going to give you one more. I'm going to tweak the assignment one, 
one little bit, because most of you it looks like have done a couple of lines. So what I'd like to ask you to do now is try one line in reverse. Try coming up with a big question first, and then seeing if you can do, if you can go from there to a hard, to an issue and a hard question, right? So see if you can go, if you can start with the big question rather than starting with the issue, okay? So you take five more minutes, let's do that, and then we're gonna debrief and, uh, and adjourn. All right. So I'd love to just hear from a couple of groups about what you came up with. Um, we have, one of the mentors has a mic. Who's got the mic? That's a serious mic. What is that thing? Wow. I've never seen that. Cool. Uh, so who would like to share um, one, one that you're particularly proud of? You think this was great work? Here you go, right over here. Oh, hold on, we, got, we have a mic for you. That thing that looks like a, it looks like, it, it looks like the box that the salt comes in to, you know, the, you know, to melt the snow, the ice, I don't know. Yeah, cool. Okay, and so take us through the line. Okay. How do you love? Great. Great, thank you. That's great. Um, another, who, who else? Who's another group that wants to share? Okay, up, up front here. We got some folks up front. Oh, you can throw the mic? <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. I gotta get one of those. Yeah. Let's guess. Hold on. Let's guess which was your big question. Okay, go on. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Tell us. Go ahead. And where do you feel at home? <laughs> that, that was the one I thought you were going to. That's great. Okay, so we saw how there's a movement, right? You started with, in both these cases, you started with a sort of practical question that confronts you. Um, you move through, there's a series of hard questions. And a lot of times we would stop at those hard questions, right? We would stop there. And by taking them to the next level, it, well, you tell me, what do, what do you see that that does by connecting those hard questions to the big questions? What do you see about that? You might not see the value yet. It's thought provoking. What else? It makes it easier to take action. Is there a reason why? Okay, so it might make room for more diversity of ideas to come out, right, because there's more, more ways of looking at it. You might get more perspective on a policy question by saying, by finding what are some of these underlying human questions that are there. We got one back here who wants to go? You just want the mic. You, you, see, you, you want that mic in a box. <laughs> Please tell us. <laughs> So thank you for, and, and you just, without my suggesting it, you took us now in the opposite direction. When we start with, what were the big questions you started with? When do you need to go up? When do you feel secure? Great. And so when we think of like, when do you feel secure, or what do we choose to ignore, right? When we think of those questions, we actually already heard how that can lead you to transgender issues and making a more inclusive trans uh, community for transgender students. It could also lead to First year orientation and moving on to campus, when do you feel secure, right? There are different perspectives that those questions lead us to, and there are different issues that they lead us to. What's really cool about this is that 
by having that common, that common big question beforehand, it actually draws a bridge between the student who may have no awareness of uh, LGBTQ or transgender issues on campus, um, and, you know, but, but who is experiencing a lot of issues around moving on, moving away from home, and moving to college. Um, and somebody who um, is, th th those two people may never have encountered each other and, and think they, they have what to connect over. But the truth is they're both struggling with similar questions because we have bodies and we're on, and we're on the planet. It doesn't mean they occupy the same political position or anything like that or privilege. We're not going to get, not going to say that. But we all share those questions. And regardless of our um, political orientations, right, all of us um, are, live our lives in relationship with big questions. And that actually gives us something to talk about. That gives us a way to understand each other, to share stories, to build trust. And after the break, what we're going to do is um, talk a little bit more about how big questions and hard questions work together to help us build trust and build communities that can tackle the problems that we need to tackle. Um, but right now, I think we're at 12.15, um, or right, right about. And so um, we're going to break to your workshops. Mike, do you, you want to send people off? OK. So, um, uh, so the, the faculty, the staff, um, uh, some of the staff members and I were, were sitting, having our own sort of conversation while you were off um, doing your workshops uh, just now. And we were talking a lot about the, um, the political climate and uh, issues on campus and sort of campus climate. And we were talking about how what we've been, uh, what, what we discussed earlier and worked on, big questions, how that can be helpful um, in, cre in, in all sorts of ways for creating relationships, uh, creating healthier relationships and, um, and healthier political, uh, uh, political climate. Um, and I want to just share with you uh, this graphic here that talks a little bit more, I can get that air out of the way, um, talks a little bit more about the relationship between big questions and hard questions. Hard questions are the stuff that our politics is really driven by, right? What should we do about climate change? What should we do about immigration? What should we do about local council elections in Geneseo uh, and student, student uh, voter registration here, um, right? How should we solve certain problems uh, that we have, whether they're related to uh, racial inequality or socioeconomic inequality or LGBTQ inclusion, all sorts of things that um, we struggle with as policy matters. And, uh, and so they live over here, right? They live over here. And in order for us to um, get to a point where we can have healthy debate about those questions, healthy debate requires some stuff that comes beforehand. Um, and it requires some stuff that comes after. Uh, very, very frequently, you know, I find that folks who focus on um, civil discourse or civic engagement are really focused on, okay, so what's necessary for healthy debate and, you know, how do we, how do we have healthier debate? Well, I think our proposition is that there's some, some other stuff going on that's related and it, re and it really gets to this cycle of what we would call big questions and hard questions. That big questions ultimately, as you saw from the cards that you engage with, they lead to stories, right? They lead to stories rather than debates. So they lead to stories about where we feel at home or who we're responsible for or when we feel powerful or when we feel ignored um, or invisible. Um, but they lead to stories. And those stories, the fact that everyone can share stories and talk about them, that makes them fundamentally democratic. They're egalitarian. Everybody can tell a story about feeling at home or not feeling at home. Um, I have yet to meet a human being who doesn't have a story to share. And so the fact that we can all share those stories means that we're on an equal playing field. And none of our stories is more privileged than another. When we can share stories, if we can listen to each other's stories, that allows us to build trust. We find commonality. Wow, both of us have something in common. We both have a story about that question. Right? And actually, there's probably a lot of dimensions to, the, to that story that are similar. And there might be some really profound and important differences, too. Um, and in the, in the course of that conversation, we build trust. You need trust. Once you have trust, you, you, you need trust in order to be able to sacrifice for each other. You can't sacrifice for people who you don't trust. And democracy, ultimately, requires our ability to sacrifice for each other. We have to sacrifice at least half of the population is not going to get 
Well, that's not true. Not at least half the population. A good chunk of the population is not going to get the outcome that it wants on November 8th during the election. Right? A good chunk of the population is not going to get what it wants in any policy debate. And part of the trick of democracy is that since every one of us is a citizen and an agent and should be, and should be a full agent in the democracy, every one of us is sort of a sovereign unto ourselves. Right? Every one of us, we, we sort of feel like, well, nobody's more powerful than we are, and so you know, my vote ca counts just as much as anybody else. That's how it should work. And so it holds out the promise in a certain sense that you know, we should be able to get our way every time. Of course, that's not what happens. We should get our way about half the time, hopefully. Right? And the other half of the time, we have to um, sacrifice and abide by the outcome of the election or the decision that's been made. And so we can only do that. We only hold together as a community and as a country if we can sacrifice for each other. If we can't sacrifice, it's not going to work. And if we, can't, if we don't trust each other, we're not going to be able to sacrifice. And if we're not sharing stories, we're not going to be able to trust. So it's all, all in the service of um, that dynamic. And that leads us, once we have that, then you can bring up your hard questions. Then you can bring up the policy discussions. And you can have a healthier debate because people can actually talk about issues substantively. And we were just, we were just talking about um, how in your class in high school, I forgot, you, remind me your name. So we were t we talking about her high school in the Bronx where she, had a where she had a teacher who said, you know, taught them how to debate, and debating begins with listening. And now she's able to listen to people and say, I understand where you're coming from, and I disagree with you for the following reasons. And when you can do that, right, it doesn't have to get emotional. It doesn't have to be about identity politics. It can be about we can have a substantive disagreement, and we can still see each other as citizens who are responsible for each other. That leads to healthy debate. That leads to um, better reflection. Right? That leads to us being able to reflect together on, um, I may not have a monopoly on the truth. Right? I'm probably not 100% right. Um, there are probably some things that somebody else is saying that I should be listening to. And yet we have to make a decision. And that leads us, and, and the way we, we reflect on those debates, the process of that reflection actually leads us back to big questions, the questions that we share. And so there's a cycle here that we have to understand about how big questions and hard questions work. Big questions should never be used as a way to co-opt political speech. Today on a lot of college campuses, right, um, we certainly saw it last fall, there's plenty of political activism. And sometimes that political activism can get co-opted by administrators saying, well, let's have a conversation about it, right? And, uh, and in the meantime, nothing actually happens. Well, if it doesn't lead to some actual outcome, then you're just co-opting people's activism, and that actually erodes trust. My contention would be, though, we're not actually going to make more progress um, on solving the issues we have to solve unless we actually start to have conversations about the questions that we share. And so you know, my vision, you know, people ask me, like, what's your big vision for asking questions? My vision would be the next time there is a major crisis on campus that um, we don't have a giant town hall meeting with a panel of experts in front and then some microphones floating around and people shouting at each other. But instead, what if we had a room that looked like this and maybe we actually got rid of the tables and, and we were having conversations with each other about big questions. And those conversations led to us reflecting on the issues of the day. That would be a very different way of going about it. And that would lead us, I think, towards um, ultimately better decisions. And something about my incorrect username and password. Let me fix that. So, I just want to leave you, I, I wanted to leave you with that because the power of what, what we're doing today is not just a, a nice little skill to have. It is a very useful skill to have in your back pocket of how you move from issues to questions. And I hope it's something that you will use in your work as leaders on this campus and in the rest of your lives. But I would actually argue this is a really essential thing for us to be, um, to be mindful of. Um, that there are certain kinds of questions that we're not asking enough, uh, we're not asking enough and we're not having enough conversations about it. And the more we have conversations about those questions, I think the stronger we're going to be as a community and as a democracy. So um, with that, I want to invite us to engage in um, there's two closing activities. But so the bigger one is, on your table, magically, uh, during the break, um, there appeared some post-it notes. And there are, there are three colors. There are enough for each, of, for each person on your t at your table to have two post-its of each color. So blue, yellow, and pink. You should be able to have two blues, two yellows, and two pinks each. What I'd like you to do is 
use those post-it notes to write down on the blue, what's one thing you've learned about yourself over the last three hours? Okay, just listen to the assignment first and then you can do the, and then multitask. Uh, so what's something you've learned about yourself that's on the blue? What's something you've learned about others that's on the yellow? And what's a question that you're leaving with that's on the red or the pink? So, and you actually can see on the walls here, they're color coded, so blue, self, yellow, others, pink, question. And write one thought per post-it, one thought per post-it. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to write those down. So please go ahead and do that. And you shouldn't need to talk to, talk to other people, though you can. But uh, just focus on writing it down. Okay. So you probably haven't filled out all of them. So you can keep filling them out. But if you are ready, um, I want to invite you to pick one of the walls here and take your post-its and post them in the appropriate spot. Okay? So the blue under the blue, the yellow and the yellow, the red and the red. And, um, and then read through what other people have posted. Okay? So read, you, you'll be able to read what everybody else has written. And as you do that, I would like you to find one, only one, not one of each color, just one post-it that you didn't write that resonates with you. Okay? Does that make sense? So you're going to get up, you're going to go over to one of the walls, you're going to put your post your sticky in the appropriate spot, you're going to read through others, and you're going to pick one. You will come back to your seat with just one post-it. If you are leaving with six, you will come back with one. Um, one post-it that you did not write that speaks to you. Okay? So when you're ready, go ahead and feel welcome to do that. All right, so if you come, come back to your seat, and we still have the mic. Do we still have the, the foam box mic? Still there? Oh, there it is. So could we, and, and these will still be up, you know, afterwards. Uh, could we just get, a, I'd like to have three volunteers just to share what you picked from the wall. We got we got a few hands here, so Mike Man over there. Great. Thank you. How can I be a better listener? Terrific. Let's pass it, pass it to the next person. Ooh. <laughs> and don't kill them. 
All right. We survived the pass of the mic. Yeah. So I think when you say you need to have a little bit of logic, um, one of the things that you have to do is you have to go about and kind of figure out what you can kind of do to get it away. And um, I'm sure it's not going to make any difference, but like the people in that production team are there, so you should spend that time and you should start doing that right away. Great. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Take a few more. This one here. All right. <laughs> Say it again. Thank you. Thank you. Is there one more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would, I would invite you, actually, uh, if you are so inclined, if you want to take a picture of the post-it that you, you, know, that, that you took and, um, and you wanted to either tweet it or post it on Instagram, our Twitter handle is at AskBigQs. Um, ask Big Questions was too long, and ABQ is the city of Albuquerque. Um, <laughs> when we have our first national conference, it's definitely going to be in Albuquerque. But, um, uh, but that's so at, at Aspect is our Twitter handle or Aspect Questions is we're on Instagram. Um, and if you wanted to take a picture and, uh, and post it, um, that'd be pretty cool. And you, you know, we'd like to sort of share and, and then you can start to see actually as we, you know, as more and more campuses do this, we start to build up, you know, you start to see who says what and what's, what's common and what's different. Um, in the future, in the offing, there will be an app. Um, because you know we can actually be able to see more, more more of people's responses if we can do it digitally, but we're getting there. Um, but in the meantime, I want to just close our time together um, with uh, a poem. Um, and so the last sheet that you have in your folder is a poem by uh, an American poet named Marge per Piercy. Who's heard of Marge Piercy? Oh wow! Okay, I get to introduce you to Marge Piercy. That's great. Uh, Marge Piercy is from, uh, was born in Detroit uh, in 1936. Anybody here read tarot cards? No tarot cards? Okay, so the Seven of Pentacles is a tarot card. Uh, and if we had a picture of it, which I should, but I don't, um, if we had a picture of it, uh, it's a picture of um, like a farmer standing uh, at harvest time. Um, with, with a bunch of like, fruits and vegetables and stuff. And, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm a big believer that the world needs more poetry and that um, uh, the way that language works in poetry is something that is akin to the way that it works in big questions. Um, and so I wanted to share this with you by way of uh, concluding our time here and, uh, and sending you off into, uh, into the fall. Um, and I know that the vice president's gonna have some remarks um, afterwards, but. Um, so this is the Seven of Pentacles. Under a sky the color of pea soup, she is looking at her work growing away there, actively, thickly, like grapevines or pole beans, as things grow in the real world slowly enough. If you tend them properly, if you mulch, if you water, if you provide birds that eat insects a home and winter food, if the sun shines and you pick off caterpillars, if the praying mantis comes and the ladybugs and the bees, then the plants flourish, but at their own internal clock. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot tell always by looking what is happening. More than half the tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as the earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper that brings down the tree. 
spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden, gnaw in the dark and use the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections, create real nodes, build real houses, live a life you can endure, make love that is loving. Keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in, a thicket and bramble wilderness to the outside, but to us, interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and lairs. Live as if you liked yourself and it may happen. Reach out, keep reaching out, keep bringing in. This is how we are going to live for a long, a long time, not always. For every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. I have a lot to say today. Um, where's Josh? Where'd he go? I love that poem. The folks who come to my staff meetings on Wednesday mornings know I start every staff meeting with a poem. And I think we're going to be reading that one at a future meeting. Really nice. So I want to uh, take a minute to thank everybody involved in the planning and execution of this event, but especially one person, uh, Tom Matthews. Tom uh, took on this project of this leadership symposium basically because I asked him to. And Tom has worked here forever and really didn't need any new jobs and probably uh, can tell me how to do my job better than I do it. Uh, but he took this project and he made it his own and I'm really happy with what it's become. So thank you, Tom. <laughs> and thank you everybody else again who had a hand in this event. I walk to work every day, and for the past three days I've walked to work, somebody has stopped me, a neighbor, somebody walking their dog, and said, uh, the students are coming back, are you glad? Right, and I just want to say here, I'm glad. I'm really happy. <laughs> I'm the vice president for student life. We need students to have student life. This place is dull without students, it really is. All right, we finish up our reports and our paperwork, catch up around July 4th, and then I'm ready. I want to uh, see students back on campus, and so it's great to see you all. And if anybody else asks me, I will tell them, yes, I'm glad to see the students back. So this event, I think, also uh, <coughs> is just not about leadership development. And it's just not about, uh, this year anyway, asking big questions. Uh, but for me, it, it's an opportunity to try to imagine and try to reflect on the culture that we're building here at uh, Geneseo. Uh, an intellectually curious culture, a reflective culture, a caring culture, a culture where we look out for each other, a culture that we know is not perfect, far from perfect, but we want to be better. We want to be better. And what a wonderful way to kick off the year. So thank you all for taking a little time out of your summer vacation, coming back early to help us spread these seeds and to prepare to welcome uh, the rest of our students in the next uh, few days. One of the things I like about the summer is that I get a chance to read because I really don't read much during the year. I go to meetings and respond to 150 emails a day and so on, and I really don't get a chance to pick and choose the things I want to read. And there are some things that I got a chance to uh, read this summer that really helped me understand this work. And just this past weekend, I discovered a uh, article really was an interview by the, the author of a book called The Abundant Community, and his name is Peter uh, Block. And I see Josh nodding his head, so you're familiar with this book. I was not, 
I rushed right out to get it. He's got a new book called Community, The Structure of Belonging. And I know community is a word that is used a lot here at this institution. That's why when I saw these book titles and I saw the interview, I wanted to read it. And as I started to read it, it really made sense to me in the context of this event today and the theme of the event, Ask Big Questions. And I think I want to share a couple of excerpts from the interview and you'll know why I made the connection to asking big questions. So first, Block was asked how he ended up writing about community and working to build community. And basically, the answer he gave was that it began with a big question. I wondered, he said, whether I could make a living and do something useful at the same time. Whether I can make a living and do something useful at the same time. That's a big question. Maybe you're grappling with that question. Maybe the seniors in the group are especially grappling with that question. I know my son, who graduated from college in May, spent a good part of the summer gra grappling with that question. According to Block, school led me to think the answer was no. That didn't make me feel too good. School led me to think the answer was no because the whole movement in schools has been toward practicality. So maybe I disagree a little bit, Block, at this one because I think the kind of education we offer at Geneseo with our liberal arts focus, with our emphasis on individual development and community development and leadership development is a little more uh, is about something more than practicality. But I kept reading. Block went on to say, what occurred to me in graduate school was that I had found something to do that I love and that I could make a living at. And it was the field of organizational development. So when I was about 21 years old, I found something to care about other than getting by and making a living. I found that I could learn more about myself. I found I had big questions like, will I always be such a jerk? Will I always be alone? Will I always feel like an outsider? I wanted to answer these questions through the work that I did. I don't know about you, but these are questions I've asked myself. Will I always be a jerk? Will I always feel alone? Or will I sometimes feel alone? Am I an outsider or an insider? Big questions lead to self-understanding. Big questions lead to understanding of others. And big questions are vitally important because in the words of Peter Block, the touchstones of his career have been driven by his curiosity. What is curiosity if it's not to delve into a life of big questions? Block goes on to say that life, his life has not only been guided by big questions, but by teachers. I liked this. I have always found teachers, he told his interviewer. Every time I read a book or found something that changed my mind, I would write people and ask, can I come to you and learn from you? By doing so, according to Block, I constructed my own education. I'm thinking you have an opportunity this year to construct your own education. Sure, we've got curricular requirements, but there's also great latitude in what you can learn and study here. I believe you can construct your own education through your involvement in co-curricular activities. I believe you can involve, uh, construct your own education through volunteer and community service opportunities. And I believe there are many, many people in this room, your peers, staff members, faculty members, who are interested in helping you construct an education and construct a life construct your values by listening and by teaching and by learning. We've all proclaimed by virtue of different positions that you're in that you are leaders of our community. I'm really hoping that today is the beginning of the further development of your capacity to ask big questions, and to be guides and teachers for others. One of the things I love about working at a liberal arts college is that we can all teach each other. We, we can all learn from each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to lead is to teach, basically, in my opinion. To lead is to teach. These concepts are indivisible. 
Maybe your fellow students may not think of you as teachers right now. Maybe you feel you don't want to teach us. I can tell you we need you to teach us. Those of us who are leading the institution at a different level, we need you to teach us. Block said, I found teachers in surprising places. We need to find teachers in surprising places. Then Block continues, I found other people. I found community people. I found the civic space, the space of the common good that put me in touch with people who cared about something, who were committed to something. And the real challenge in our lives is not only to find something we care about, but also to find people who care about something. I believe all the people in this room are here because they care about something. Maybe they care on a micro level about themselves. Maybe they just care about their team or about their club or about their residence hall floor. Maybe they care more about this community we call Geneseo. Maybe they care about the country and the direction that it's going in. But I'd like to think we all care deeply about something. Block points out that if we're in a community, we need to think about this big question. What are these people good at in this community? In community work, Block said, I'm not interested in what's wrong. I want to know, what do you like to do? What are you good at? What are you willing to teach people? These big questions are vital to living in community. These are questions that I am going to remind myself of throughout this year. We pride ourselves at Geneseo at teaching critical thinking, of developing critical thinkers. Maybe we were a little too critical. Maybe we were a little too quick to judge. Maybe we need to little, ask a little more often, what do you like to do? What are you good at? What do you want this place to be? There was so much in this interview. Black went on to point out the whole purpose of higher education was to prepare people to be citizens, to be learners, to be curious about life, because that's what drives us as humans. But what's also interesting about life is its unknowability. Josh pointed out there are some questions that we can't answer. There are certain questions there is no answer, no matter how much research, studying, learning we do. Block does provide a hint on how to handle the unanswerable and the unprovable, though. He says, what we are asking for is people to have faith in community, to have faith in our humanity, to have faith in possibility, in mystery and miracles, and relationships. And it's that faith that can propel us even through the darkest times. I think there's a great faith in relationships at this institution that drives us some of those relationships are contained, again, to the teams we are on or the clubs we belong to. And I would hope that this year you will strive to build bridges across those relationships, across those teams, across those groups, because that strengthens this community. Black goes on to say, community means you and I together can produce something and construct a new future together. It means that we need each other. It doesn't mean that we have to like each other. But it means that if we want to be safe, if we want to be healthy, we want to be successful, we need each other in order to do that. So community is about our real interdependence with each other. Asking big questions is finding some commonality in those questions and in those answers. It's not about like-mindedness, like but it's about interdependence. I would call that an authentic community, not where everybody agrees, not where we leave out everybody who doesn't agree, but we make time to listen to each other and to talk with each other, to get to know each other, to help each other, to support each other, to lift each other up when we're down, and to help each other fly when we're up. So let's look, move forward this year in this community we call Geneseo by asking big questions of ourselves and of others. Like Block, let's agree that we want to make something together. Let's make learning. Let's make community. Let's make friendship. Let's make a welcoming, inclusive, safe place. 
Let's make a community we will love forever. Thank you.